also earns at least the real living wage, and we're reviewing the chief executive pay framework in the public sector. <laughs> Depending on how you got here this morning, you might have seen some of our local industrial heritage here in Clybank. This is a town with a really proud working class history. Some of you might have got off the train at Singer Station, which is named after the sewing machine factory that used to dominate that part of the town and whose clock used to dominate the skyline across all of Clydebank. That factory, that area, is where Red Clydeside began, the era, uh, the era of working class radicalism uh, here on the Clyde. In 1911, the 11,000 workers in that factory, mostly women and children, went on a months long strike over cuts to their wages and increasing workloads. Clydebank also played a really pivotal role in the anti-war movement during the First World War. People here knew that that war was a pointless slaughter and they resisted not just the jingoism and the attempts at conscription, they also resisted the attempts to use the war as a pretext to roll back the hard fought for and hard won rights of workers. The town's experience of the Second World War was a very different one. Most of you have probably learnt something about the Clydebank Blitz when you were at school. This was the only town to be completely destroyed by German bombing in Britain during the Second World War. And my gran was there that night in a really spectacular example of bad timing. She'd been evacuated, but that was the one night that her and her mum had returned to Clydebank. She was five years old, uh, but to her last day, she vividly remembered those 48 hours, how every window in the building that she was in was shattered by the blasts, how the adults hid the children at the bottom of the coast, at the bottom of the stairs, before leaving to help fight the fires and the orange glow as a town that was completely engulfed in flames seeped in to where they were hiding. My grand's old house is now the family home for a family who had to flee the civil war in Syria. As someone who experienced the destruction of war firsthand here in Bank, I know how happy she would be about that. Across this region and across all of Scotland, we have a really proud history of welcoming those fleeing war and persecution into our communities. I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud that I passed the first motion in the Scottish Parliament proposing that we give refugees the right to vote, something that became the law here in Scotland ahead of the 2021 election. That welcome that our communities and our Parliament has provided is in spite of the incompetence, the hostility and the outright racism of the UK, <clears throat> the UK government and Home Office. That's a Home Office which isn't fit for purpose and which absolutely must be abolished. Some of you might be aware that directly across the river from here, in fact you can see it, the UK government has placed 174 young men seeking asylum in a hotel in Erskine. Many members of the community in Erskine want to offer support to these young men. They want to get to know these guys and welcome them to the community. But they're not able to do that because the Home Office and their private provider, Mayor's Group, have refused all attempts to engage with them. They've created exactly the conditions needed for fascists to take advantage of the concerns that some in the community have, playing on that fear of the unknown. And that is exactly what's now happening. A pathetic group of former BNP members and associates of those with links to banned far-right terror groups have now arrived in Erskine and are trying to divide the community. They're trying to whip up hostility to vulnerable young men stuck in the hotel. I'm proud to be working with local residents, including Renfrewshire Greens, who are resisting that creeping fascism. This is exactly where Greens should be, fighting racism with solidarity. Our enemies don't arrive in dinghies, they come to this country in private jets. <laughs> this job certainly has its tough moments, as those of you who've caught some recent media articles will be aware of, but it's a huge privilege for me not just to represent my community in Parliament, but to go to work every day with the overwhelming backing of this party to deliver the greenest and most progressive programme for government in Scotland's history, the Butte House Agreement. In the face of yet another economic crisis and unprecedented hostility from the Tories at Westminster and at Holyrood, the Scottish Greens have spent the last 18 months delivering policies which redistribute wealth and power from those who have far too much to those who need it the most. It's easy to talk a good game about eco-socialism on Twitter when you're in no position to actually deliver it. But thanks to years and decades of work by the people in this room and across our party, 
the Scottish Greens are delivering real change. Here in Western Bartonshire, 11,000 young people have between them already taken over 900,000 free bus journeys since January of last year, thanks to the Scottish Greens. And maybe it was one of them who took the 50 millionth free bus journey in Scotland last month. As our finance spokesperson, I've had the privilege over the last year of working with John Swinney to produce the greenest budget in Scottish history, what the BBC Scotland editor described as the most left-wing budget. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, who are hardly natural bedfellows for our brand of radical politics, confirmed that Scotland now has by far the most progressive tax and social security system anywhere in the UK. Put simply, we're asking those who can afford to pay a bit more to do so, and we're redistributing that money to the lowest income families and the public services that they rely on. For the budget we've just passed through Parliament, I secured a rise in income tax on the highest earners and a rise in the tax paid on the purchase of second and holiday homes. Collectively, the tax changes that we delivered this year will put more than half a billion pounds into Scotland's public services every year. And that's on top of the progressive income tax changes that Greens had already secured. Together, the reforms that we have delivered over the last few years mean that Scotland's public services are better off to the tune of a billion pounds every single year. That's funding green manifesto commitments, like mitigating the Tories' cruel benefit cap. That benefits 4,000 of the most vulnerable families in Scotland. That is equal socialism in action. I want to thank the Green councillors who worked with me through that budget process. Some of the changes that we make fly under the radar, whether it's increasing fines for illegal parking or delivering empty property relief, something that will start a week from today. Every little bit of resource and power that we give to local councils really matters. And Patrick and I are really excited to work with our councillors on much, much bigger reforms to the council tax, up to and including its full and complete replacement. That budget wasn't perfect. How could it be when our spending envelope is largely set by a UK government that's continued to cut it? And when the Scottish government's hands are tied so tightly by the completely inadequate powers of the devolution settlement? Just this year, £1.7 billion was wiped off the value of our budget by inflation, an inflationary spike largely caused by the Tories at Westminster, but which they refused to compensate us for. In the face of the cost of living crisis and continued Tory hostility, we're doing everything we can to provide support. That's why this year we're delivering another Green Manifesto commitment. We are capping the cost of school uniforms. And that's part of a huge package of reform across our schools and our education system. This last week, I hosted student climate activists from the Teach the Future campaign in Parliament, where the Education Secretary, Charlie Ann Somerville, and I were able to tell them that we are working to deliver, we are going to deliver exactly what they've been asking for, which is an education system rooted in the principles of climate justice and which equips our young people with the skills and knowledge that they need to be part of tackling this crisis. And that's not to mention my personal passion project. We are abolishing the SQA and we are replacing it with a body that's fit for purpose. And we're replacing the Victorian era system of high stakes end of term exams that the SQA presides over. Conference, we are doing so much vital work, but I want us to go so much further. I want us to have the powers of a normal independent country so that we can spend our resources to the benefit of people and planet rather than having to spend hundreds of millions of pounds a year just mitigating the cruelty and incompetence of Westminster. And I think the people of Scotland want that too. Recent months have given our party record poll after record poll because with Greens in government, they like what they see. Unprecedented climate action, a fairer economy, an unwavering commitment to human rights, including LGBTQ rights. Good luck to any party and any politician who wants to give up and roll back on the progressive changes that the Scottish Greens are delivering. And on that note of delivering progressive change, I'm delighted to welcome our first co-leader this morning, the Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings, Active Travel and Tenants' Rights, someone who's delivering real change in government every single day Patrick Harvey.
Thanks very much indeed, Ross. Um, I, can, I can barely describe uh, how impressively Ross has managed to achieve both uh, the, the great work he's done on his, his, constitu his, his, his constituency work that he talked about uh, within the region, but the portfolio work on education and finance, but combining that with being a, a tireless party organiser uh, and also a great company eating pakora around the corner from Parliament. So um, <laughs> thank you for that. Ross uh, also talked about work that's happened over decades. And conference, uh, I want to go back a little bit further than Ross did. I want to tell you a tale of two parties, probably not the two you've got in mind. Because on this weekend, on this day, at this moment, we are standing at a major junction in Scottish politics. Two days from now, we will see a new First Minister leading the Scottish Government, the first government in the UK's history in which Greens are at the heart of decision-making. We're overseeing programmes, we're delivering on promises, we're turning long-standing Green ideas into reality. But it's a key moment, too, for the greatest battle, the far, far greater battle that we all face together, the battle for a livable planet. And the latest stark warnings from the UN at the start of the week make clear yet again, this is not a time for pausing or prevarication, it's a time for urgent action. And that's what has to propel us into next week and every week beyond. And that fact that we're standing in this moment is why I want to tell this, this tale of two parties, because the first is a party that's 50 years old this year, as coincidentally am I. <laughs> Both, no, I know I don't look it, do I? That's very kind of you, that's very kind of you point that out. Um, formed, uh, both of us, the party and myself in 1973, the party was first called People. Two years later, it was renamed the Ecology Party. Later, the Scottish Ecology Party emerged while still being part of the UK party. But they knew they were only really contesting elections in the hope of getting their ideas noticed. They were never really close to getting anyone elected. The winds of change were starting to blow through other parts of Europe, and the breakthrough of the German Greens in the mid-'80s inspired a further name change to become the Green Party. And in 1990, our origin story moved on to a new chapter with the Scottish Green Party becoming an independent party. But those first decades brought little political success. Even a surge of Green votes in 1989 led to disappointment because the absurd first-past-the-post system prevented it from translating into any elected Green parliamentarians. That generation of Greens looked around with envy as Green parties across Europe made real headway thanks to voting systems that allowed new voices to flourish. And many of those parties also made their way into governments, locally, nationally, sometimes with great success, sometimes with huge challenges, but always with a determination to make a difference. So this party, this first party I'm describing, is the one that I joined in the year 2000. And Ross assures me that that means I get to call myself a millennial. <laughs> That's how that works, isn't it, yeah? Yeah. It was a party with one MSP, with no councillors, and not much prospect of a breakthrough. A membership of less than 500 across the whole of Scotland, meeting at kitchen tables in school halls and back rooms of pubs, but it was a party full of ideas and a burning commitment to a fairer, greener Scotland that we knew was possible, but utterly lacking the capacity and the levers to make change happen. Making change happen is the reason we exist, not just to pressure others, as the early party did, not just to demand, but to deliver. And not just a party for the good times either. We're here to bring a challenge into politics about the greatest crises humanity has ever faced. Crises we're already living in, but which require dramatic political and economic change 
if we're going to avoid unthinkable impacts. Crises which already threaten to destabilise our world far more than any bout of inflation or even a pandemic can do. We exist for the hard times. If a Green Party isn't an organisation and a movement that's willing to take responsibility when things are tough, then we're nothing. And back in those early days, we had no opportunity to do that. No influence, barely any voice. No access to where decisions are made. Now, in the devolution era, things began to improve. In 2003, we briefly rose to seven MSPs, but that proved fleeting too. Since then, we've seen coalitions, minority and majority governments, and we've worked hard to put forward bold but workable ideas and achieve what change we could, haggling for every concession. But where we are now is so different. So the second party in my story is today's Scottish Green Party, just as full of ideas and burning commitment to that vision of a fairer, greener Scotland, just as we were in 1990 and 2003, but with a membership that's grown 15 times over, with branches throughout Scotland, a party with 35 councillors in almost half of Scotland's councils working to deliver change for their communities from Shetland to the borders. In Orkney, our two councillors have secured a goal to reach net zero in the islands by 2030, and they've ensured that blue carbon and biodiversity enhancements are priority projects for the council. In East Lothian, our sole green councillor, Shona McIntosh, has ensured that our major flood protect prevention scheme uh, will be based around ecological restoration of the river, working with nature, not fighting against it. And in South Lanarkshire, Kirsten Robb continues her fantastic Space to Play campaign, recently winning a vote, committing the council to renew and expand play parks and opportunities for outdoor play. Our green councillors are shifting the way we do local government in Scotland, and they're making our communities better, greener, fairer places as a result. We're also a party from which eight MSPs were elected in 2021, our highest ever number and our highest ever vote in a Hollywood election, and two of those MSPs serving as ministers, entering government for the first time anywhere in the UK's history. And a party that's enjoying by far its biggest sustained level of support in the opinion polls since the cooperation agreement was signed, a level of support that could see between a dozen and 16 Green MSPs elected. Conference, after 18 months of Greens in government, the people of Scotland like what they see. More people are supporting the Scottish Greens than ever before in our history. And not only are we gaining more public support than ever before, we're making things happen like never before, securing record levels of investment in walking, wheeling and cycling that would have seemed unthinkable even just five years ago. Not only ahead hugely of other parts of the UK, but even ahead of our Dutch neighbours. <laughs> Taking through our first ever Scottish Green Government Bill, with our emergency legislation on rents last autumn. And that's ahead of our new housing bill introduced later this year, bringing in permanent rent controls and new rights for tenants. Agreeing a redistributive budget, which takes money from the wealthiest and puts it in the hands of the lowest income families through the most progressive taxation in the UK and our unique Scottish child payment. And none of this has stopped us campaigning actively for even more, as Gillian Mackay's excellent campaign for safe access zones demonstrates, taking a hugely important issue and building a campaign around it that looks set to make a, a real difference for people right across Scotland. But that issue, that issue is one where progressive values have come under the spotlight a bit in recent weeks. Just like the equally important commitment to a full ban on conversion practices or defending both our democracy and the rights of trans people by challenging the UK government's abuse of the Section 35 power to block the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Well, we need to be clear that a sincere commitment to progressive values cannot be an optional extra in a choice of a First Minister. It is a necessity. <laughs> Yeah. 
and it's And it's not just about the policies and the values either. It's also about the constructive way of working that's written into the Butte House Agreement. Genuinely, both sides seeking common ground. Yesterday, uh, I'm told that Kate Forbes uh, said she wanted to continue working with us, even though she's made it clear in a televised debate that working together simply meant us accepting her agenda. That's hardly the spirit of cooperation. But conference, there is so much more to what we can deliver if, and only if, we see a First Minister who shares our commitment to the progressive values, the genuine spirit of cooperation and the bold policy programme that run through the agreement you approved. Now, some of what we do plays out on a public stage, but the crucial part of being in government is building constructive relationships, the ties of trust, mutual respect and good faith. That's what allows us to make the difference every day. So I really want to thank my Scottish Green MSP colleagues for their tireless work, because just like Gillian, Ross, Ariane, Mark and Maggie have built those relationships with ministers and advisors across every portfolio. A lot of this mostly happens behind the scenes, and so folk don't get immediate recognition for it, but that hard, patient work lets us get to grips with the machinery of government. It allows us to make change happen at every opportunity. And we're working to make better links as well between Scottish and local government. This week, I chaired a working group bringing together councils uh, and the Scottish Government to find agreement about ways to strengthen councils' financial powers as part of a new deal for local government. At a time when politics has never seemed so charged, so divisive, so intent on tearing things down, we are defiantly bucking that trend. We're doing so because that's who we are, but also because that's what we must do. Our commitment to a fairer, greener and independent Scotland isn't something that can be postponed. The clock of the climate emergency ticks louder with every passing day. That's why we've still got so much more to do, and it's why Greens are needed in the places where decisions are made. On Monday, the UN warned us that business as usual is failing. The Climate Change Committee told us back in December that the policies put in place over the last 10 years are not big enough, not bold enough, not fast enough to meet Scotland's moral and legal obligations. And the climate plan which Scotland prepares this year must be and will be our most ambitious, our most challenging ever. And that's why the Scottish Greens need to be at the heart of that process. So we're achieving more than ever before. We're more popular than we've been in our history. The Scottish Greens are needed more than ever before. And of course, it's exactly for that reason that there are people who want us pushed back onto the sidelines. The right-wing press, the protectors of the status quo, vested interests, big polluters, and of course, conservative MSPs like Douglas Ross and Fergus Ewing. <laughs> Conference, these are the people who want to unpick or unravel or end the Butte House Agreement. These are the people who hunger for green ideas to be kept out of government because they fear change or they've got selfish reasons for preventing it. They're terrified by the idea that a better, more progressive politics born out of good faith and trust might just succeed. Conference, these are not nice people. <laughs> and not people any Green should be on the same side as. Of course, I understand the seduction of opposition. I remember it. There's a comfort in being able to demand perfection without ever having to deliver anything in haggling for a few concessions and celebrating them when they come, and watching what we see as the policy failures of others and loudly condemning them. That's where we've been for most of our past. It can even be fun. It's certainly easy, and it doesn't achieve very much. But when you, our members, decided so overwhelmingly to back the Butte House Agreement in August 2021, we made that transition from that early party to the new Scottish Green Party that we are now. We followed the path of so many of our fellow Green Parties across Europe and as far away as New Zealand. 
We made commitments that you endorsed, which we're delivering, and we're resolved to complete that work. So if, if Monday sees a First Minister we can work with, and we deliver on our promises, if we go into the next election for the first time with a track record as a party in government, showing the results you get when you vote Green, if we do that, we'll give ourselves the chance to continue to shape the politics of this country in the critically important years ahead. So my story of two parties is also one of two futures. From this weekend, let's take renewed strength from what we've achieved and from what we've learned. Let's seize the opportunity of the next few years ahead. Let's be that party that not only called for a fairer, greener Scotland, but made it happen. And now, yeah, why not? <laughs> now, I am delighted to hand over to someone, who, someone else who's making that change happen. Our MSP for Lothian, co-leader of the party, and to be completely honest, my favourite fellow minister, <laughs> Lorna Slater. <laughs> Good morning. In May 2021, 220,000 people across Scotland voted for the Scottish Greens, a record number of Green voters putting us into government for the first time, making history here and across the UK. When those 220,000 voters put their trust in us, they did so because they wanted change. They wanted a Scotland that puts people and planet over profit, that embraces diversity and rejects bigotry. They wanted the Scottish Greens to be disruptors, to shatter the status quo that is killing our planet, deepening inequality and stifling progress. Conference, that is our mission. So we've been busy. And with action, there is always reaction. Dishonest, wild, overreaction, especially from the Tories. We threaten their vested interests, and they know it. They see me there, making those decisions instead of them, standing up to them, and they lose their... Over the last 18 months, we've made it clear that only the Scottish Greens have the vision and determination to overcome the reactionary resistance to change. Conference, you made that happen. Scottish Greens in government is a result of years of dedicated volunteer work by yourselves and our fellow party members and activists. Whether it's knocking on doors, delivering leaflets, turning up in all weathers, Holding a volunteer position with your branch or with the National Party, every bit of that work matters, and that is why we are where we are today. As Greens, one of our core aims is to protect and restore our natural environment. For too long, our wildlife has been in decline, our ecosystems overexploited, and our natural environment degraded. As Minister for Biodiversity, it has been my privilege to start the change. One change we can be especially proud of is the groundbreaking Nature Restoration Fund, which we announced at COP26. I knew the fund would make a difference, but nothing really prepared me for the scale of change that it would initiate. Already we have invested nearly 30 million pounds across Scotland, mostly in rural communities, restoring river catchments, eradicating invasive species, planting trees, saving the rainforests, and helping Scotland's most threatened species bounce back. And conference, I have had the privilege of seeing the change that you are helping to make happen in person. I released beavers into Loch Lomond. <laughs> I met the extreme botanists who are rescuing our most endangered native plants from cliff faces. I saw the diggers restoring the River Dee and trees being planted along its bare banks. I joined children to plant trees in leaf links, 
bringing nature into my own neighborhood. What could be more important? From the air we breathe to the food we eat and the water we drink, they all depend on a healthy environment and functioning ecosystems. Conference, I hope that you are as proud as I am that it is our party, that it is Scottish Greens in government who are finally fighting back for nature, that it is our disruptive party that is bringing back life to our dead hills, cleaning our rivers and rewilding our seas. Make no mistake though, delivering on our ambition requires more than disruption. It requires focus, determination and resilience. The pattern of the last 18 months is clear. We introduce green policies that are popular with the public based on sound evidence and urgently needed. Policies that tackle the climate and nature emergencies to which Tories and Labour are happy to pay lip service, but then they oppose action at every step of the way. The Scottish Greens stand up for communities and nature, and we are not intimidated by the wealth and power of vested interests. Last week, I was called an anarchist for taking the side <laughs> of, a, <laughs> of a small island community rather than that of a Brexit-backing multimillionaire. As far as I'm concerned, that's the job I'm here to do. Thanks to the Butte House Agreement, we are introducing no-take zones to our seas, as other countries have done. These highly protected marine areas will be special places that are set aside for nature, improving fish stocks to the benefit of ecosystems and fishers alike. 10% of our seas will be left undisturbed to allow our marine ecosystems to recover, to change at last the long-term policy of decline that has seen fish populations collapse and coastal communities devastated. Yet Labour and the Tories are already opposing them, and Kate Forbes just this week called for them to be scrapped. There can be no doubt that without Scottish Greens in government and without the Butte House Agreement, there would be no one standing strong for our environment. Without Greens in the room where it happens, without Greens pushing every day in government and in Parliament, the progress we need would not happen. Critical policies would be deprioritized, watered down, delayed, under-resourced. And that's why we need to be in the room. That is what you and we have been working so hard to achieve all these years. Which brings us to Scotland's deposit return scheme. <laughs> A scheme that will dramatically increase recycling, reduce littering and cut emissions. A tried and tested practical policy based on successful schemes the world over that exemplifies a core principle for the Scottish Greens. The polluter must pay instead of the public picking up the bill for the rubbish that industry produces. The Tories have warned that if we continue with the scheme, we will face Armageddon. Armageddon. I didn't realize that the four horsemen of the apocalypse were famine, pestilence, war, and recycling. <laughs> the Tories, supported by their lab Labour colleagues, have spent months trying to undermine Scotland's scheme. They unleashed a torrent of misinformation relentless and noisy attempts to derail the scheme, to undermine it and me. Yet all of the polling shows that the vast majority of the public, over 70%, support it. They can't quite believe it when even in the face of relentless personal attacks and misinformation, I am undaunted. <laughs> I have a message for them and for anyone else who would try and prevent or delay the change we so desperately need. I will persist. The Scottish Greens will persist. 
Saving the planet is not something we give up on when the going gets tough. And let's face it, in the big picture, deposit return schemes are the easy bit. We're here to do the hard bits too. No one said saving the world was going to be easy, but a deposit return scheme is a good way to get started. The Tory efforts to stop Scotland's deposit return scheme extend all the way to Westminster. Alistair Jack, the Secretary for State for Scotland, is doing everything he can to undermine me and the scheme, repeatedly briefing the media of his intention to bring it down and in the process break the frameworks that are meant to ensure cooperation between our countries and to protect devolution. It is extraordinary that just a few metres along the road from the Scottish Parliament, the Scotland office appears to be actively working against us. He has held this threat over us for months, knowing that just the threat undermines confidence and risks chaos. As with the gender recognition reform, this is Westminster's new playbook. In the case of DRS, they are using new powers they gave themselves under the Internal Market Act, an act that was passed after Brexit without the Scottish Parliament's consent an act that we opposed because, as we said at the time, it could give Westminster a veto over the Scottish Parliament. Well, we were right. What will Alistair Drack try to veto next? A ban on single-use vapes? Highly protected marine areas? Our fracking ban? Who knows? Because he treats the Internal Market Act as a total veto, wielding it for political purpose and without any consultation or democratic mandate. They have shown a contempt for devolution and for our parliament, completely unopposed by Labour, who once championed devolution, but now meekly watch as the Tories take an axe to our democracy. Only Scottish independence can protect democracy in Scotland and the powers of the Scottish Parliament. That should be clear to everyone in Scotland now. Conference, it has been an honour and a privilege to serve in the Scottish Government on behalf of the Scottish Greens and alongside the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Her integrity, compassion and leadership have been an inspiration to us all. In just two days, SNP members will select their new leader. It is their choice that they must make. We have a choice that we must make too. On Monday at a special council meeting, the Scottish Green Parliamentary Group will take advice from our party on who to vote for as First Minister. We will together choose whether we want to continue in government. The first 18 months of the Butte House Agreement has begun a process of transformation, of building a better Scotland through hard work and the politics of cooperation and collaboration. This is how politics should be done. And although it has only been a short period of time, the people of Scotland and our environment are already better off because of it. And that's before the transformative changes we've put in motion have taken effect. Rent controls, land reform, education reform, reducing car travel by 20%, a human rights bill, new national parks, protecting 30% of our land and seas, a natural environment bill, another uh, one billion pounds to invest in energy efficiency. Conference, we have unfinished business. I want us to stay in government and see through the change we have begun, but not at any cost. We will never be a party that is prepared to put our principles to one side. We will only vote for the SNP's new leader to become First Minister if they are committed to the politics of cooperation, if they respect and share our values of equality and environmentalism, if they will prioritise climate justice, and if they agree that trans rights are human rights and that our trans siblings cannot be used as political fodder by Westminster. fundamental issues for us, they are non-negotiable. 
If the next First Minister shares these values, then we would not just remain in government, we should redouble our efforts to build a fairer, greener and independent Scotland. But we are first and foremost true to ourselves and committed to delivering change. We will put ourselves in the place where we can best achieve that. If that is in opposition to an SNP government that has lost its way, abandoning its commitments to cooperation, equality and environmental progress, then so be it. With regret, that is where we would go, because Scottish Greens will always work for people and for planet, and you can't do that in partnership with a First Minister who has already set themselves in opposition to both. Our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. That is what the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this week in the publication of the latest, most stark and most terrifying, report from the world's leading climate scientists that we have ever seen. The climate crisis requires leaders who can rise to the greatest challenges. In the face of adversity, leaders need to show persistence and commitment. There is no space for those who ditch green policies in the hope of political gain. Conference, while the past month has been a time of turmoil in Scottish politics, the Scottish Greens have remained consistent and strong. We know that the time is now to stand up for minorities, to welcome refugees with open arms. We know that the time is now to build an independent country and rejoin the European Union. We know that the time is now for climate action and to restore our natural environment. Fast track, not delay. Everything, everywhere, all at once. the disruptive force of the Scottish Greens will deliver for Scotland's people and for planet. Get a break.